Hi everyone, so thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be focusing upon the high yield congenital heart conditions which crop up in medical school final exams. Okay, so just a little bit of information about the medicine guide. So the medicine guide is a YouTube channel that I've created which has a series of videos to help support you throughout medical school. So I've got a series on how to be successful at medical school, so focusing about how to be successful during the preclinical years, how to be successful during the clinical years, how to get the most out of your GP placements, how to get the most out of your hospital placements, and how to succeed in your clinical OSCEs. I've also got a series dedicated on high yield paediatric conditions. So these are the high yield conditions which crop up in final exams. So I've got videos on high yield child with mass, high yield paediatric rashes, high yield limping child, high yield genetic conditions for finals and high yield vomiting amongst children. So please watch my YouTube videos. Please support my channel by giving me a thumbs up, subscribing to my YouTube channel. Please share with your friends and also please post in the comment section below. So without further ado, let's get started with today's video. So the outline for today's video is that I'm going to be focusing upon the high yield congenital heart disease condition. So I'll be focusing upon cyanotic congenital heart disease because that's really important that you're able to recognise what pathologies lead to cyanotic congenital heart disease and what leads to an acyanotic congenital heart disease. So the first top tip for today is that cyanotic congenital heart diseases usually are caused by diseases which begin with the letter T. So truncus arteriosus, transposition of the great arteries, tricuspid atresia, tetralogy of phallus, and total anomalous pulmonary venous return. Then I'm going to be looking at the high yield acyanotic congenital heart diseases. So these are diseases which cause the child to appear pink and perfused as opposed to cyanosed where they appear very blue. So the high yield acyanotic congenital heart diseases involves atrial septal defect, a ventricular septal defect, an atrioventricular septal defect, and also a patterned ductus arteriosus. Okay. So number one, truncus arteriosus. So this leads to a cyanotic congenital heart disease, and you can remember that because it begins with the letter T. So truncus arteriosus is when you've got this common trunk created between the aorta and the pulmonary arteries. So that means both deoxygenated blood from the right side of the heart and oxygenated blood from the left side of the heart are going to be entering in both the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So that means you've got what I like to think of as mixed blood. So you've got the oxygenated blood, the red blood, and you've got the deoxygenated blood, the blue blood. So that's going to be mixed together, essentially, and it's going to enter into the aorta and the pulmonary arteries. So now you've got almost purple blood, as you can find in the diagram, travelling through the body. So that means the, baby's not, the baby or the child isn't going to get the full oxygenation, because obviously, whereas they might have had 100% of oxygenated blood in their body before, now, because you've got this purple blood, so you've got a mixture of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, now they might be getting only 70% of the oxygen that they would have had if everything had been normal. Okay, so this is really, really high yield. So truncus arteriosus, so the child will present like I alluded to before with cyanosis. They've got poor feeding, excessive sleepiness and poor growth. So in terms of management, it's managed surgically. So those are the key features that you need to remember for truncus arteriosus, okay? So in transposition of the great arteries, this is due to the aortic pulmonary segment failing to spiral on septation. So that means that essentially the aorta and the pulmonary artery is swapped over. So normally the aorta will receive the blood from the left side of the heart, so that's oxygenated blood, and then travels to the rest of the body. However, in transposition of the great arteries, the aorta will receive blood from the right side of the heart. So it's receiving deoxygenated blood and that's what's traveling around the body. Normally, the pulmonary artery would have received blood from 
the deoxygenated right side of the heart and then it travels up to the lungs in order to be oxygenated. However, in transposition of the great arteries, the pulmonary artery is connected to the left side of the heart. So that means it's receiving oxygenated blood from the left ventricle. So this oxygenated blood is traveling up the pulmonary artery, going to the lungs. And I hope you can appreciate that because deoxygenated blood is traveling into the aorta, we're going to have deoxygenated blood supplying all the systemic organs. So that's includes the brain and the kidney. So I hope you can appreciate that the child will be cyanotic because of the deoxygenated blood traveling around the body. So transposition of the great arteries, it's exceptionally high yield and even more so what's especially high yield about this condition is that the SBA will present a situation where the child is cyanotic within the first week of life or typically within the first one to two days of life. So if a child presents within the first week of life with cyanosis, this is without doubt transposition of the great arteries unless proven otherwise. Also, they might present with a loud S2 heart sound, but usually cyanosis within the first week of life is classical of any exam question concerning transposition of the great arteries. So you need to do a chest x-ray, ECG and echocardiogram. Now the chest x-ray of transpos transposition of the great arteries is very classical. So it's described as an egg on side with a string appearance. So if you have a look on the x-ray, the child will have a very narrow upper mediastinum and a cardiac shadow present on the chest x-ray. And I hope you can appreciate that by looking at the chest x-ray below. So we need to give prostaglandin to help maintain the patency of the ductus arteriosus and surgery is going to be our definitive management of transposition of the great arteries. So just to summarise, transposition of the great arteries is exceptionally high yield. Please try to remember that a child will present with cyanosis within the first week of life and the chest x-ray will be described as an egg on the side with a string appearance. Okay. So the next condition is tricuspid atresia. So the major risk factor for tricuspid atresia is that these patients will present with Down syndrome or will be suffering from Down syndrome and then develop tricuspid atresia. So in tricuspid atresia, the tricuspid valve, which is found on the right side, and the entire right side of the heart, so that, that's the tricuspid valve and the right side of the heart, so that's the right atrium, the right ventricle, is underdeveloped. So therefore we must have an atrial septal defect and or a patent ductus arteriosus for survival. So typically the child will present well at birth but then becomes more breathless and increasingly cyanosed and this cyanosis will be especially evident around the lips and on the skin. So the child will have very poor weight gain and the child will be easily tired, especially when feeding. So in terms of tests, oh sorry, and other classic features of tricuspid valve atresia is that the child will present with an ejection systolic murmur, loudest on the upper left sternal edge, and they will have a prominent apical impulse. So the key tests that are needed for tricuspid atresia is that a chest x-ray, ECG and echocardiogram will be needed. And in terms of management, we give the prostaglandin infusion to help maintain the patency of the ductus arteriosus and surgery is needed. OK. OK, so now we're going to cover tetralogy of phallus. So tetralogy of phallus is the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease in children. It's caused by anterior malalignment of the aortopulmonary septum. So in terms of the risk factors, Dijord syndrome or chromosome 22 deletion is a major risk factor for tetralogy of phallic. Now I have discussed Dijord syndrome in quite a fair bit of detail in my high yield paediatric genetic conditions. So if you please watch that video, then that will give you a lot of information to help understand DiGeorge syndrome. And that is something that that's quite high yield and does crop up in medical school exams. So the criteria for identifying a child with tetralogy of fat, I personally found it quite confusing when I was at medical school. So I've simplified it into four key features using the mnemonic of VROP. So they need to 
present with at least three out of these four symptoms or three out of these four features to help identify um, patients who are suffering from tetralogy of Fallot. So they need to present with ROP, so ventricular septal defect, a right ventricular hypertrophy, an overriding aorta, and pulmonary stenosis. So in terms of the signs and symptoms, so typically a child with tetralogy of Fallot will present with cyanosis after the first week of life, because any child presenting with tetralogy of Fallot during the first week of life is transposition of the great arteries unless proven otherwise. The child will also present with, like I said, pulmonary stenosis, so an ejection systolic murmur. They'll experience tet spells and phallic sign, and that's something that's very key in classic and it crops up quite a lot in the SBAs. So tet spells are life-threatening. So tet spells is when the child appears hypersynotic, when they're crying or feeding. So that's when the child will appear very, very blue when they're crying or feeding. And this will be obviously very distressing for parents. So make sure that you're able to identify tet spell when it's described in the SBAs, please. And phallic sign is when the child is squatting down to compress the femoral arteries. And this is in an attempt to reverse the right to left shunt. Now, in cyanotic congenital heart disease, there will always be a right to left shunt because this is what's leading to the cyanotic appearance of the baby. You've got the deoxygenated blood on the right side of the heart being shunted or being pushed into the right side of the heart where there's oxygenated red blood. So you've got blue blood which is creeping into the red blood and that leads to almost like a purple blood. So it's mixing together the oxygenated, deoxygenated blood and that's traveling around the body systemically and that's what leads to cyanosis. So always, always remember whenever they're discussing cyanotic congenital heart disease, please remember that there's always a right to left shunt which is driving the cyanosis, okay? So in terms of tests, we need to do a chest x-ray, an ECG and echocardiogram. So similar to transposition of the great arteries, tetralogy of Fallot also has a very classic chest x-ray appearance. So in tetralogy of Fallot, a child will have a boot-shaped heart with an up-tilted apex, and I've got an example below, and hopefully this will help you understand in better detail, okay? And in terms of management, we need to have surgical management, all right? So let's move on to the next one. So in total numbness pulmonary venous return, this is when the pulmonary veins are creating a single channel, which is connecting to the superior vena cava. So that means all of the oxygenated blood returning from the lungs, rather than entering into the left atrium, this oxygenated blood is being shunted into the superior vena cava. Now the superior vena cava contains deoxygenated blood, so we've got this mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So we've got mixing of red blood and blue blood creating essentially purple blood. So we've got the cyanotic blood, so mixed blood traveling and being distributed throughout the heart. And that's why it leads to cyanotic congenital heart disease. So we need to have a patent foramen ovale or an atrial septal defect, which is in this situation essential for survival. So these children will, will be presenting with cyanosis after the first week of life, so similar to tetralogy of Fallot, they'll be presenting with cyanosis after the first week of life, and they'll be presenting with signs of heart failure, so poor feeding, lethargic, shortness of breath. Okay. So in terms of tests, we need to do chest X-ray and an echocardiogram, similar to tetralogy of Fallot and transposition of the great arteries. Total numbness, pulmonary venous return, has a very classical chest X-ray description. So it's described as a figure of eight or a snowman appearance. And I've got a little example here on the bottom side to help you appreciate this. And total numbness pulmonary venous return is a surgical emergency. So we need to perform emergency surgery. OK. So moving on to the high yield acyanotic congenital heart disease. So atrial septal defect is something that always crops up in the exam. So looking at the diagram, you can see quite evidently that there is an atrial septal defect. So this is allowing the oxygenated blood from the left atrium being shunted 
into the right side of the heart. So you've got a left to right shunt. Whenever you have a left to right shunt, then the baby will appear pink and perfused, so it's an acyanotic congenital heart disease. So atrial septic defect is classically caused by Down syndrome. So they'll be presenting with an ejection systolic murmur at the upper left sternal edge, and that's classic and very, very important to identify an atrial septic defect with. And they'll be suffering from signs of heart failure like breathlessness and recurrent chest infections. So in terms of tests, we need to do a chest x-ray, an ECG and an echocardiogram. So echocardiograms will be diagnostic and they are your gold standard in this situation. So in terms of management, we need to have surgical intervention. OK, so that's the key features of atrial septic defect. And these are the key points that you need to remember for your exams. So a ventricular septic defect is similar to an atrial septic defect, except you've got this defect present in the ventricles. So similarly, again, the main risk factor is Down syndrome. Also, children suffering from fetal alcohol syndrome are at risk of developing a ventricular septic defect. So this is a situation where as the baby was developing the womb, mum was still drinking alcohol um, at a very large quantity and large volumes and unfortunately these children suffer from fetal alcohol syndrome and a complication that they can develop is like I said a ventricular septic defect. So in terms of signs and symptoms these children will have signs of heart failure and breathlessness after the first week of life and unlike an atrial septic defect Children with a ventricular septic defect will present with a pansystolic murmur at the lower left sternal edge and a heaving apex beat. Now, Eisenmenger syndrome is classic of a ventricular septic defect, and this is something that you need to remember for your exams. So, ventricular septic defect is an acyanotic congenital heart disease. So, when it's acyanotic, that means that there's going to be no shunting from right to left. Instead, the shunting is going to be in a left to right fashion. Okay. Now, Eisenmenger syndrome is when there is reversal of the left to right shunt. So that means the child will now present with signs of cyanosis. So they'll have cyanosis on their lips or on their fingertips. And this is because previously there was a left to right shunt, but now it's been reversed. So now the shunt is now right to left. So you've got this deoxygenated blood escaping into the systemic circulation, and that leads to cyanosis being present on the fingertips and the lips. Okay? And that's high yield for a ventricular septic defect. So in terms of tests, you need to do a chest x-ray, an ECG, and an echocardiogram is going to be diagnostic. And surgical management is needed in this situation. Okay. So an atrioventricular septic defect is when you've got a septic defect involving the atrium and the ventricles. So the major risk factor is Down syndrome, and I hope you can see that's a common risk factor for all of the septic defects. So the child will present with signs of heart failure, so recurrent chest infections, breathlessness, poor feeding, poor weight gain, and also tachypnea. So in terms of tests, because an atrioventricular septic defect is so strongly associated with Down syndrome, so if you've got a SBA asking you what's the most common congenital heart disease associated with down syndrome, then the answer is an atrioventricular septic defect. It's more strongly associated with Down syndrome than a ventricular septic defect or an atrial septic defect. So that's why, because of, this, because of the association between Down syndrome and an atrioventricular septic defect is so strong, that's why an atrioventricular septic defect is normally picked up during the antenatal ultrasound screening process. Okay. And this is managed initially medically to help support the symptoms of heart failure. 
and ultimately we need to perform surgery to resolve the atrioventricular septal defect. Now, if you're a little bit unsure about Down syndrome, how Down syndrome presents, what trisomy it's associated with, then I would advise you to please watch my high yield paediatric genetic conditions video because that goes into quite a lot of detail describing Down syndrome as well as the other high yield genetic conditions which are found in peds. Okay, so patent ductus arteriosus. So the risk factor for patent ductus arteriosus involves congenital rubella syndrome and Down syndrome. So these children will present with a continuous machinery like murmur, a left subclavicular thrill, a collapsing bounding pulse, and also differential cyanosis. So these are four very key features which will help to identify a patient suffering from patent ductus arteriosus. So this is what you really, really, really need to know like the back of your hand because it comes up classically time and time again in the exam questions. And children will also suffer from a faltering growth and poor feeding. So in patent ductus arteriosus, the duct will remain patent. So normally around the second to third day of life, the duct will close and this is very normal. It will close and it and forms the ligamentum arteriosus. However, in patent ductus arteriosus, the name gives it away, the duct remains patent. So that means we're still getting shunting from the aorta, so that's the oxygenated blood, being shunted into the pulmonary artery. So we've got again mixing of red blood and blue blood. Okay. However, Eventually, we can develop Eisenmenger syndrome. So this is when we've got reversal of the shunt. So we've got reversal of the normal left to right shunt. So that means that now we're going to have a right to left shunt. So that means that the deoxygenated blue blood in the pulmonary artery is going to get shunted into the aorta. And that's going to lead to symptoms of Eisenmenger syndrome. So eventually the child will present with sinuses in the fingertips, sinus around the lips. Okay. So in terms of tests, we do chest x-ray, ECG and echocardiogram. And our echocardiogram is going to be an investigation of choice. In terms of management, we give patients who are premature. So children who were born, so babies who were born prematurely, so that's before 37 weeks gestation, they will help, they will receive intermethacin or ibuprofen. Now these are both examples of NSAIDs and NSAIDs help to close that duct. But if the child was born at term, so after 37 weeks gestation, they need to undergo surgery. Okay, so that's the end of the high yield congenital heart disease conditions. Hopefully you found that quite useful. Now, there were quite a few scenarios where the congenital heart diseases were associated with the other genetic conditions. So if you're a little bit unsure of the trisomies and the underlying pathology for the genetic decision, sorry, the genetic diseases, then please do watch my high yield paediatrics genetic conditions video. If you've enjoyed my video today, please give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and also please comment in the comment section below. I wish you all the best for your exams and thank you for watching my YouTube video today.